Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Giulio, for this presentation and for the, the, the nice uh, invitation. Thanks to uh, uh, C CFM for organizing this. Thanks for the workshop organizer, uh, Marilou, Tony, and uh, Valentin. So uh, I will. So uh, we, in my group in Lyon, we, we work on uh, using statistical mechanics tools in order to, to try to, to, to solve some, some problem in, in, in climate science on uh, the numerical aspects, on the methodological aspects related to the, the workshop we discussed. So here the point is to predict extreme heat waves, which are very rare. So we use mainly two tools. So the first tools are rare event simulation. Which, uh, which is a, a way to resample and to, to get more statistics using the models. And the second tool is a convolutional neural networks. So I will show you how we use these two tools and uh, then how we, tr we, we try to, to, to couple them. So I want to thank my uh, uh, co co workers. So Francesco Ragone is uh, the, the one that made most of the works about relevant simulation with the climate models. So we started with uh, Jeroen Wouters. Then I, I work with my colleague in Lyon uh, uh, for developing uh, the use of a deep neural network for this. Uh, Patrice Abri, Pierre Borgna, uh, Valerian, uh, Valerian uh, Jacques Dumas. Uh, he was a master student working with us. Georges Milosevic, a postdoc, and Francesco Ragone. And uh, uh, finally, uh, when we try to couple machine learning with relevant simulation, we have published a work with Dario Lucciante, a PhD student, Joran Roland, and Corentin Herbert, my colleague in uh, in Lyon. So before I, I begin, I want to speak about uh, Labo 1.5. So I, we we are much. Uh, uh, we are much uh, uh, interested in, in reducing the impact. Uh, of uh, our activities. So this is very important. So as a climate scientist, this is what we, we ask to all the society. And so the, the main point is that uh, when we look at uh, how we behave, us as scientists, and when we look at our impact, so we realize that we are among uh, the worst. Uh, we are among the ones that have more increased their impact uh, during the last 20 years. And th this is mainly related to uh, travel, uh, airplane travel, and so the key, the key idea here is that uh, we, we should continue to, to ask the society to move, but we should move ourselves in a direction which is, uh, uh, which is for, for the, the, the better. So uh, here we, uh, we Labo 1.5 is an organization in France that gather many, many scientists, many labs, and so the point is uh, to have a, uh, an initiative which is uh, uh, bottom-up for which we push the institution to, to move uh, a bit faster. And so there, there, there are many very interesting things going on, experiments in some uh, 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 pilot labs that uh, do uh, actually experiments in order to, to make sure that decision can be taken at the level of the lab. And so this is very interesting also at the scientific level because it's a, uh, it's a social experiment how we, we, we manage to, to, to make decisions uh, to, together. So if you are interested, you can go uh, on the web page and, uh, and participate to, to this initiative. Another thing, so uh, uh, I, I am coordinating a GDR, Groupement de Recherche. So it's uh, something to, to gather scientists at the front scale. So the title of the GDR is Theoretical Challenges for Climate Sciences. And so here the point is to, to integrate a bit the, the community to make multidisciplinary science between mathematics, physics, computer science, uh, statistical physics, data science, and uh, the people in the climate community and the atmosphere science and the ocean science. And so the point is to, to try to, to, to make a better use of uh, the existing uh, capabilities in France uh, on this subject to do this in interdisciplinary things. Okay, so I come back to, to my main subject. So I will uh, give an introduction to both uh, to extreme heat waves, to relevant simulation, and to machine learning. And then I will go on uh, the three specific subjects, relevant simulation, uh, machine learning for predicting extreme heat waves, and the, the coupling of, of both. So just let me first introduce you to climate extreme events. 
so it will be very brief. So, but I just want to give you one key idea. Uh, here you see the, uh, the, the, the annual death by major climate-related disaster. This is a graph from one of the UN agency. And so you see the last 25 years. And so you see here events with a, a, a death toll of the order of uh, hundreds of thousands. So for instance, you have the Western European heat waves in 2003 with uh, uh, 70,000 people dying on top of usual number during that, uh, that summer. And so in France, it was 15,000 people dying on, on, uh, on top of usual number. So there is a, a cyclone called Nargis uh, in, in Myanmar with uh, 150,000 people dying. And the Russian heat wave in 2010, it was a heat wave that was combined to, combined to, to fires and to, to pollution and the, the joint effect of uh, heat and pollution led to uh, about 1,000 people dying. So the key idea here is that you have only three of these events and they are all very different from the point of view of the dynamics. And so it means that the few most extreme climate events have more impact than all the others. So it means that uh, when we want to study the, the statistics of these events, so it's really the, the rare one that matters. It's really the rare one that we want to study. And so, of course, this is a serious uh, scientific challenge because most of these events are unprecedented. So we have no, no data in the hist historical record about these events. So we have to rely on models, and, but we, we, we have to rely on models and still understand how these models relate to, 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 to historical record we have. So it's, it should be an indirect way to uh, validate the, the, the model. And so if you want to do that with a model, it's extremely challenging because you, you will get this event extremely rarely. And so this is um, the main point of uh, my talk today, is how to simulate these extremely rare events using uh, climate models. So this is the examples of uh, the 2003 European heat wave. So what you see here is uh, the temperature anomaly. So it, it's the temperature uh, during the, the month uh, July, August 2003, minus the temperature during the, 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 the year that preceded the, this uh, event. And so you see fluctuation of order of uh, 10 degrees. So 10 degrees is the typical fluctuation for uh, weather fluctuation for temperature. But here it's 10 degrees average during a month. And so the point is that uh, to get 10 degrees average during a month, it means that at some point, the uh, temperature fluctuation was much higher. And a key point here is how long does this event uh, last? Uh, the fact that the temperature is very high by itself is not very, uh, has not much impact. What has impact is when this very high temperature lasts for very long. And so again, this is uh, somehow unprecedented. Uh, we, we have no uh, no examples of this uh, uh, in the historical data. And so the point is that uh, the, so this, uh, this is a map uh, that uh, uh, corresponds to what is called the wet bulb temperature. So it's something that takes into account both temperature and humidity. And so here, to, to make the story short, everywhere where it is red here, uh, you have a wet bulb temperature which is about 32 degrees, which during uh, a few days uh, each year. And so this uh, is uh, in a scenario, this, is, this would be in 2070 with a scenario of a business as usual uh, uh, if we don't do anything about climate change. And basically what this means is that in this area, uh, where there are hundreds of millions of people living, it would be it become unhabitable during the, this, uh, this few days during a year. And so this is potentially a huge impact, and this is probably the, the worst impact that we, we can expect about uh, climate change. And so the point is to, to, um, to be able to, to really understand quantitatively the risk about that, when we, we, m we might reach this risk, and to, to make sure that we, we will completely avoid it. Okay, so at a scientific level, so the three key problems uh, I already told you. So the historical, the historical records are way too short 
to make uh, any meaningful prediction just based on the statistics. So we have climate models which are really wonderful tools. They have been developed during the last 30 years. So it's, it's, re it's really something impressive what you can get with the climate models. Still, they, they are not perfect. They are far from perfect. They have biases. And so the, the point is that the, the more precise they are, the more computationally costly they, they are too. And so if there is a trade-off between how precise you, you, you can simulate the climate and uh, how costly it is in terms of numerical simulation. And so uh, the point is that because the, these extreme events are too rare, they cannot be computed directly using the models. It would be too costly. And so the practical question is how to sample the, the probability and the dynamics of uh, very rare events in uh, this complex model and how to build effective models uh, which are relevant for estimating the, the probability of these rare events and to do physics just for basic understanding of uh, what's happening. And so this is where we will need uh, rare event simulation. So the key idea is how to study a 10,000 year heat wave with a, a simulation that lasts only 200 years. And so then uh, this is uh, where comes uh, um, rare event simulation. So the first rare event, rare event simulation were done by Khan and Harris in Los Alamos in 1953. And so this uh, uh, seemingly uh, according to an idea of uh, von Neumann. And then you, in statistical mechanics, in applied mathematics, uh, for turbulence and climate application, you have many people working for decades on this uh, subject. And for instance, for turbulence and climate application, there are the group of uh, Jonathan uh, with Dorian Abbott at uh, NYU and Chicago, and people like uh, Rainer Grauer and Tobias Grafke, Eric van den Heiden, and uh, what we do in our, our group uh, mm -hmm. in Lyon. Okay, so let me now make an introduction about machine learning and more specifically machine learning applied to climate dynamics and uh, we weather forecast. So the, the, the first idea is that the Earth is the most observed physical system in the world. So you have a huge amount of data. This data grows exponentially. And so it's, it's a direct observation. So for instance, mainly satellite observation. But it's also a huge amount of data that comes from output of weather models and climate models. And so it's, uh, the, the, the key idea is uh, how to do the best with uh, this, uh, this huge uh, amount of data. And so here you see, for instance, uh, uh, something that comes from uh, uh, ECMWF. ECMWF is the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. It's basically the leading institution in Europe uh, for uh, making a weather prediction. Uh, and uh, I, d I don't work at all with CMWF. I, I use this picture just for the sake of uh, illustration. And so they, they wrote something which is called a roadmap for the next 10 years about machine learning for CMWF. And what you can see here is uh, in all of these uh, boxes here, you have uh, many applications of machine learning. Each of the box is one application of machine learning. So you have uh, machine learning which is used for making uh, uh, the best with the observation. So you have lots of inverse problems to solve in observation. You have to connect the observation to the models. There are machine, you, you, you need to do data simulation. So this is how this observation would be lead, will, will be connected to the physical models. You have numerical weather forecast itself. I mean the, the model, how it is run daily. And you have a post-processing. Once you have uh, the model output, you want to understand or you want to, to have more local prediction. And so you, you, you have a, a huge uh, amounts of uh, different applications of machine learning. And there are specialists for each of these applications. And so this is just to say that uh, these fields, uh, climate and weather, has always been uh, at the edge of uh, ma machine learning. So for instance, what is called data assimilation is a very smart way to do machine learning. And it, it is used operationally for now for 40 years, uh, maybe. OK, so what we, I will do uh, myself is just a specific application, which is not in, in, in one of these boxes. I, it is w once you have the, uh, this model outputs, can you use uh, or all this data that comes either from observation or from the model output? Can you use them in order to predict 
whether you, you, you might get an extreme heat waves or not. And so typically, we will uh, uh, have uh, these kinds of fields, which are output of models, or that co these models could be weather models or climate models. In our case, we will use climate models. So here you have two maps. So the colors are the surface temperature anomalies. So it's the surface temperature minus the, the their average of one, and so you see a fluctuation of order of uh, 10 degrees, and so you see here it's, uh, it's uh, hot because you have an anticyclone, here it's cold because you have a cyclone, and so this is how the, the, the temperature field across the world uh, typically looks like. And so you have another field which are the, these lines here, so this is the 500 hectopascal geopotential height, so it's uh, at the middle of the troposphere, so you, you look at the height of the geopotential uh, on, a, on an ISO surface, and so it's, it's directly connected to the surface pressure. I mean, it's just like the, the pressure map you see on, a, on television or internet when you are looking at weather forecast. And so this is one of the key fields that is useful to make a prediction and to understand the, the dynamics of uh, weather. And so here again, it's an anomaly, meaning that uh, uh, the average the climatological average has been subtracted. And so here what you see, you see uh, uh, from the point of view of pressure and uh, uh, geopotential height that you have an anticyclone right here. And here you see that you have a cyclone right there. And so you see that there is uh, somehow a large correlation between these uh, maps and the temperature one. So we take these two fields or more, we will more use more, more fields, for instance, soil moisture or other things. And from this, we want to predict whether we will get a heat wave uh, within Tau days. So we'll, we have the observation today, and we ask whether we have a heat wave uh, uh, tomorrow or next week or in two weeks. So we, we, there is a time delay, which is called Tau in my talk. And so this is just, like, this is just a, a classification problem, it's just like uh, when you want to recognize if you have a cat on an image. So here it's, we want to recognize whether we might get uh, heat waves within Tau days. And so we, we will use uh, climate models. Uh, typically we have uh, 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 8,000 years here of data, 90 days a year because it's only during summer. And so we have something like uh, uh, several, uh, several hundred thousands of these maps. And from this, we can train a, a network just to, to, to see if we are able to predict the, uh, whether we, we, we might get extreme heat waves. So this is a very simple and basic uh, application of machine learning. And we, we will use uh, uh, off-the-shell tools, classical tools. Uh, I will come back later to the, the definition of the, the, the heat wave. And so here I just give you one message, if you want to keep just one. So this is uh, the lead time tau. So this is uh, so we, we make an observation today, and we predict the heat waves that last 15 days during the uh, and the start tau day from now. So at tau equal zero, the prediction is for the next 15 days, and at tau equal 30, we wait 30 days, and then there is uh, uh, 15 days for the heat wave. So the prediction is during the last 45 days. And so this is a prediction skill, I will explain afterwards. And I just command these uh, two curves that show you that uh, the prediction skills when we change the data set length. So this is when we get just 100 years of data, and this is when we get, uh, we, we use uh, 7,200 years of data. And so you see that uh, it is not converged from the point of view of the data set length. And so we are, in, in, when we try to do machine learning for climate application, we are in a regime of lack of data. We don't have enough data to, to have a, a, a prediction which is converged. And so this is the case in most of the application of machine learning in physics. So often we, we don't have enough data. And so this, will, this is where I, I will uh, um, want to, to couple it with rare event simulation. And so the conclusion about this uh, sm small part of the introduction is that the Earth is the most observed system with uh, an exponentially growing data set. So th those observations are coupled to physical models through data simulation techniques. And so this is a very old and very smart machine learning scheme for physically based uh, data integration. And so machine learning and deep neural networks 
They enter in many different ways for both weather forecast and climate dynamics. And the, my key point for today is that for many of uh, climate problems, machine learning should be performed in a regime of lack of data. And so this is really key for understanding the, the challenge of machine learning in, in, in this case. And so this is where I want to couple these two things because we want to use machine learning but we need more data. We, we can produce more data about these extreme events using relevant simulation. But the point is that to drive a relevant simulation uh, algorithm, we need already to have a, a, a guess about what uh, uh, the probability of the events. So we have a, a chicken and the egg problems. So we, need to, we want to use uh, machine learning to, to better drive a relevant simulation for an optimal score function. And but uh, using relevant algorithm, we want to produce uh, more data. And so this is uh, this kinds of uh, chicken and egg problem has been discussed by many colleagues uh, yesterday and uh, this morning uh, in the workshop we 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 we, had, we have together. Okay, so let me show you now what we have done uh, with relevant simulation, uh, trying to predict uh, extreme uh, heat waves. So this was done uh, with Francesco and uh, Jeroen. To give you a better sense of uh, the dynamics, I show you this classical movie by, uh, uh, by NASA. So here you have, uh, so they use uh, weather models, outputs, and so what you see here, it is the wind speed on the top of the troposphere at a height of about 10 kilometers. And so the, the colors here, uh, uh, reflect directly the wind speed. For instance, where it is red, the, the wind speed it is, is about uh, uh, um, a few tenths of meters per, per second. And so you, you, you see that uh, you have a, a very coherent structure, uh, this uh, band here, uh, which it is a jet. It is, uh, from a fluid mechanic point of view, it is somewhere where you have uh, a, a strong momentum and uh, this strong momentum is, uh, is in, a, in, in a special area which is quite narrow. So this is what we call a jet in fluid mechanics. And so this jet is called the jet stream. So it is meandering around the, the planet. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, it has uh, uh, some uh, oscillation. So those oscillations are related, when you look at this from a point of view of fluid, fluid mechanics, it's, it's, it is called Rossby waves dynamics. Those waves are, are called Rossby waves. They are uh, uh, affected much by rotation and by the stratification of, uh, of uh, the fluid. And so you see when they make these meanders, inside the meander here you have an anticyclone, and inside the meander in the other direction you have a cyclone. And so those meanders are directly connected to uh, the the weather at, uh, at, the, at the surface. And so uh, this is uh, the main driver of the mid-latitude weather. And so what is a heat wave from the, the point of view of this uh, turbulent flow? A heat wave will be when one of these uh, meanders uh, will become stationary in the reference frame of the planet. So for instance, uh, so for instance, uh, uh, here we, we were seeing the, oh, sh sorry. So we, 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 here you see this meander, you have a, a huge anticyclone. And so usually this, uh, you, you have a motion from the uh, west to the east of uh, this wave, but if, uh, the, the phase, uh, the group velocity of the wave would become zero for some reason, then you, you might get uh, a, a stationary or a quasi-stationary pattern, and this would lead to a very long-lasting anticyclonic situation, and this, will, this is what might cause uh, uh, heat waves. And, if it, and so uh, 
This is sometimes called a, a blocking event in the weather community because it's the idea is just that uh, the weather is blocked here in, in this kind of a situation. So a blocking event could be just as I described related to a quasi-stationary pattern, but it might be also related to these waves that uh, will uh, break. And if the wave breaks, then you, for a very long time you, you will have a, a quasi-stationary situation too. So there are many concurrent uh, phenomena that might lead to, to this uh, long-lasting uh, heat wave. So basically the point here is to, to, to be able to reproduce this and the, the most extreme one using the, the climate models. So we use a, a climate model, general circulation models, which are models that couple the, the dynamic of the ocean, the atmosphere, uh, the soil moisture and the vegetation. So here we use them in a, in a framework which is a rather simple, where it's mainly the, the, the atmosphere dynamics and the soil moisture which is involved. So we have used a PLASIM model, which is a, a toy climate <coughs> model, and CSM, uh, CSM, which is a, the model by NCAR in the US. So it is one of the best uh, worldwide uh, uh, climate model, one of the models that are used, for instance, to make the semi-prediction uh, that are used for the IPCC. Uh, so you, you so, so you, you see this model running, and so the two fields are the same as the one I was describing before. So you see the, t the temperature, and so here you see also the geopotential height. So in the picture before, I was showing the geopotential height anomaly. Here it's the geopotential height itself, and so you see the jet stream. You see it's meander, uh, and uh, you, you see the, the cyclone and the, the anticyclone. Okay, so we just defined mm. a, a long-lasting summer heat wave uh, this way. So we compute, uh, we look at the surface temperature, Ts. So it depends on space and time. So we average it over an area. So this area could be, a, uh, it's a typically an area of a synoptic scale. Uh, about 1,000 kilometers, so it's the typical uh, <coughs> size for the fluctuation of these jets. And so D might be anything, for instance, Europe, Scandinavia, France, or any other area of interest. Then we make a time average because we want to monitor wh whether it is uh, uh, long-lasting or not. And so here we make a time average during a time uh, capital T. So capital T might be one week, a few weeks, a month, or even a season. And we will look at extreme, uh, extreme events for, for, from this point of view. And then we, we, we plot the PDF. And so we are interested in, the, in uh, sampling the tail of, of the PDF. So I, I just show you the, the, the result uh, using this. Uh, merci. Yeah, merci. <coughs> merci. So I just show you the, the result of uh, what we got. Uh, uh, so this, is, this was in a first paper using a, a PLASIM model. And so the, there are many kinds of weather event simulation. So uh, each of them is somehow adapted to, to some uh, uh, situation. So here in this case, we use a, um, an algo a genealogical algorithm. Uh, of a type as described in the book of uh, Del Moral. Uh, and uh, it's, it's specifically called the jardina kurshan algorithm because it's uh, an ad ad adaptation of the genealogical algorithm that was used to study long-lasting, uh, the, 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 the large deviation for uh, time average for a very long time by, uh, in, in this paper by Jardin, Jar, Jardina and Kurshan. And so it is very well adapted here because we are specifically interested to events that last long. And so here you see uh, what is called the return time plot. And so this is the amplitude of the heat wave. And so here it's uh, a 90 days temperature anomaly. So it's uh, basically for a, a seasonal heat waves. And so here you see the return time. So basically those events will appear randomly. And so you look at what is the uh, amplitude for an event that come back every uh, 10 years on average, or every 100 years on average, or <coughs> every 1,000 years on average. And you, can, you, you have these curves that relate uh, the return times 
with uh, the amplitude. And so it's basically these kinds of curves which is useful from the point of view of, of risk analysis because here you, you, you have a, a clear quantification of uh, the frequency of the events and how it is related to the amplitude of the events. The frequency is just uh, one divided by the, the return time. And so you see in black, you see what we get with the climate model alone, just running it 1,000 years. And so running it 1,000 years, we have one, one instance of an event uh, uh, that has this amplitude. So it's a poor uh, sampling of uh, the return time for these events. But then we, we, we more or less correctly uh, sample the, this uh, black curves for events that, that have a return time of less than uh, uh, 100 years. And so then, we, with the relevant simulation, we were able to get the, the red curve. And the red curve was obtained at the same numerical cost as the black curve, uh, basically with a set of uh, relevant simulation. And so the key idea is that we, with simulation that lasts 1,000 years, we can get uh, estimation of return time for event up to uh, millions of years. And so if you look at it the other way around, if you fixed uh, the return time, we will get a, a much better statistics. And so this is what is illustrated on, on, on this graph. So k here is a parameter of the algorithm I will not describe. But for k equals zero, we have just have a model without relevant simulation. And so you have one event for heat waves that have a return time of 1,000 years. And you get 20 events for heat waves that have a return time of 25 years. And so this is what we get with uh, optimal value of a parameter in the algorithm. So we got an improvement in the statistics of a, a few, few hundreds for these kinds of events and uh, a bit less, ab about uh, 100 for these kinds of events. So here the, the key point is that we get several hundreds more heat waves for a fixed uh, return time at a fixed uh, numerical cost. And so this one was done with uh, the CSM model. OK, so I will not explain more uh, about that. I just want to give you one of the, so of course, we, we, we use this to, to, to understand uh, the dynamics, the physics. Uh, here, I just want to flash one of the results we got. And so with, uh, in, in our first paper, we were explaining that thanks to this uh, wonderful statistics, we were able to make what we called uh, extreme teleconnection pattern. So it is a composite map or uh, let's say it is a map which is conditioned on the fact that you have an extreme heat wave. And so here we are studying extreme heat waves over Scandinavia. And so we make these maps. It means that whenever you have uh, an extreme heat wave over Scandinavia, you, you, you make the average over all these maps. And so you see that when you have uh, an extreme heat wave over Scandinavia, you see that at the, la uh, at the hemispheric scale, you also have a heat you also have a very hot weather over Northern America and over uh, uh, Eastern Asia. And it's actually colder than usual over Greenland and over Russia. And so you see that there is uh, this pattern with a wave number three, uh, which uh, appears on the average of the events for which when you have a heat wave over Scandinavia. And so it seems uh, it, it is very striking. It was not uh, observed before. And so it's not so striking when you think that we are dealing mainly with nonlinear waves. And so basically what happened is that we have selected a quasi-stationary patterns which correspond to a set of waves with a, a wave uh, uh, group velocity zero. And then those waves are those that have a wave, uh, a wave number three. And so this gives you this uh, uh, hemispheric scale teleconnection pattern. And so this is uh, what has been observed six months after the publication of our work. So this is the real uh, data, well, real analysis data. There was actually a heat wave uh, over Scandinavia. And so you see that uh, those pattern looks very similar. So this is an average over July 2018. And so you see here it wa there was a heat wave over Canada, Japan, and Korea. And it, uh, the, the patterns look uh, quite similar. And so it shows you, then we have made a, a, a more detailed study about uh, these patterns with a hierarchy of uh, models to show that those patterns are actually uh, relevant. 
Okay, so the conclusion is, is, is here is that we can use relevant simulation to gather an amazing statistics for extreme heat waves with PLASIM and CSM. And so the dynamical mechanism is a quasi-stationary non-zonal global pattern, which is much affected by topography and uh, the ocean. And uh, the a key point that I have not discussed in detail is that the, the models reproduce correctly those extreme teleconnection patterns for moderate extremes. And so we need the model and the relevant simulation to study those teleconnection patterns for the, the more extreme uh, heat waves. Okay, I want now to go to the other subject, which is the prediction of extreme heat waves and commuter function using the, the deep uh, neural network. And so this was done mainly by uh, Valerian uh, Jacques Dumas and uh, uh, recently by George. Uh, uh, Milosevic. George is, might be here in the room. He was here yesterday. And so here, here you, you... Okay, so I remember you, we have these two maps. We have uh, uh, several hundred thousands of those maps. So we know whether a heat wave will occur or not. And so we will make uh, uh, machine learning the using uh, all, uh, all this data. And so we, we use other fields, for instance, uh, soil moisture uh, and uh, other, other fields, and we try to, to, to make the best in predicting the outcome of uh, heat wave. And so the, uh, uh, the heat wave is defined just as before, and so we, we make uh, uh, average over some area, uh, average over time, uh, of, uh, uh, and this gives us this observable, a, and so if A is larger than some threshold, a small A, then we say that we have a heat wave, and otherwise we say that we have no, no heat wave. Okay, and so the threshold small A is will be chosen such that we consider the 5% most, most extreme events, or the 2.5% most extreme events, or the 1.25% most extreme events, with different value of uh, this threshold. And so Y now is uh, 0 or 1, so it's really a classification. I mean, we, uh, we have either heat wave or we don't have a heat wave. Tau here is the lead time. So you, you, we have two time. Capital T is the duration of the heat waves. It will be two weeks in most of the application. And tau is the lead time. And so one of the key ideas is that we, it's a classification problem, but we re it's a really a probabilistic classification problem, not a deterministic one. I will come back to, to this. And so we use, uh, so we use uh, convolutional neural networks. So we do nothing fancy. We just use convolutional <coughs> neural networks as they, they are used uh, in uh, uh, image recognition, for instance. And uh, so this is, for instance, one of the structure of uh, our network. I will not describe it uh, in detail. And so it's supervised learning from this uh, 8,000 years of data. So we, we, we make uh, a few adaptations. So for instance, we use undersampling because we have a huge class imbalance. I mean, the, because the events are very rare, the, uh, the ratio of the positive events over the, the total numbers of events is very small. And so we use something which is called undersampling meaning that we, we, we make use of much less of the non-heat wave cases. So we tilt, the, the, we bias the distribution, and we unbias it when we interpret the, the result. So we also use transfer learning. So for instance, transfer learning between return levels A, or transfer learning between different uh, lead time tau, or, uh, well, uh, a few <laughs> things like that that uh, improve a bit the, the prediction. So I insist on the fact that it is a, a probabilistic uh, classification. It's not a deterministic classification. If you want to recognize whether you have a cat or not on your image, it is a deterministic classification. I mean, you actually have a cat or you don't have a cat. So here, it's not the case. I mean, the, the dynamics is uh, chaotic. And so the relation between the, the maps you have and the heat waves is uh, probabilistic in nature. And so usually when you predict if you have a cat, you get a probability, but it, it's a probability that refers to uh, your capability to make this prediction correctly or not based on the data you had. 
So it's basically a, a probability that gives you the confidence of your prediction. And so here there will be two parts in the probability we, we get. There will be a probability which is intrinsic to the phenomena and a probability which is also due to the fact that uh, our prediction might not be perfect. Okay, so for this reason, uh, we use scores uh, that really test the, the, the prediction from the point of view of a probabilistic prediction. And so for instance, we, the, the, we use the logarithmic score or the Breer score that are a classical score in a, in a weather and climate community. But the, the logarithmic score is nothing else uh, than uh, uh, the, the score which is optimized by uh, the neural network in a classical classification problem. So it's, it's and so it's, uh, so in order to test the efficiency, so we, we compute uh, the average of the logarithm of uh, the predicted probability by the, our model. Uh, and so we see we have uh, the maps, we have the outcome, and so we can compute this average uh, on, a, on a test set in order to uh, uh, see how good wa was uh, our prediction. And so we, there is just a small uh, trick we do, is that we normalize it, so we multiply it by a number A, and we add a constant B, and we chose them so that this uh, score is, this normalized score will be zero for the prediction according to the climatology. I mean, if you just use the, 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 the climatology, it means that your prediction was not better than uh, just using the climatology. And so this is our baseline, this is zero, and it would be one for a perfect prediction. Okay, so because our uh, a perfect prediction here is impossible because we have a probabilistic uh, forecast for a probabilistic phenomena, but this still gives us uh, a scale uh, between zero and one, so this gives us a sense of how good and how, uh, where our prediction. Okay, so this is one of the results. So this is the same plot as the one I, as I shown before. So this is this uh, prediction skill, this normalized log score between zero and one. And so here it means that for lead time tau, when we predict the heat wave during the next 15 days, then basically we, we have a prediction skill which is uh, significant. Uh, so we don't know how good it is from the point of view of uh, the intrinsic probability we could get, but we see that uh, it, is a it, it is really significant. And we see that compared to what we could do with uh, 100 years of data, which, for instance, with uh, historical data sets or with uh, reanalysed data set, if we have uh, thousands of years of data, we can do much better. And then the, the, the skill decreases uh, with time, somehow exponentially. So it decreases exponentially because uh, the dynamics is uh, mixing, and then we lose the memory of the initial condition. So it's, it's, it should be correct that if the lead time is too long, then th there should be no prediction possible. And so there are two parts uh, in the dynamics. There are the fast drivers, which are the geopotential light fields I have shown you before, with a Lyapunov time scale of uh, uh, a few days to, to, to a week. This is typically the time scale for weather prediction. And so this corresponds to this exponential decrease here. But you see that here that even after 30 days, predicting 45 days with the, the, the duration of the heat wave, we still have a prediction skill. And so this, this prediction skill for a long time is due to what are called the slow drivers. And so here the slow drivers is the amounts of uh, humidity we have in the soil, the soil moisture. And this affects the, pr the probability of having a heat wave which is extreme. And so this is uh, why we, get, uh, we still get a skill here uh, for a very long time. And so the key, the key message about this graph is that we are in a regime of lack of data. And so this is, uh, this is very important. So we, we, have, we, have done, uh, we have used this tool to make process studies, to, to study different things about uh, these heat waves. But uh, uh, so I, will, I won't sh show you much about that because I don't have time. But I just want to show you one, or key, uh, one of our key results. And so here the question is, which is the optimal data set geographical area? 
So you have two sets of curves here. So the blue curve has the same as before. Uh, uh, the for 7,200 years and for 100 years. And the red curves are obtained using a different... Uh, so we, we, we take the data set, but rather than using the hemispheric data uh, all over the northern hemisphere, we rather use the, um, uh, just the Atlantic and the Europe to make the prediction for heat waves over France. So it means that we don't use all our data set. Why we do that? We do that because people used to do that, saying that this is more efficient. And so what we see on this plot is that, uh, indeed, if you don't have enough data, it's better to use just this reduced uh, geographical area. You are doing much better. But if you use all the data, then the two curves, the, the, the blue curves becomes better. And so it means that uh, if you have enough data, there, there is information at the hemispheric scale that you don't get at the regional scale. So it means that it's worth using the, the hemispheric scale, but in order to be able to, to use it, you really need to have a huge amount of data. And so here it's another way to, say, to, to show that we are in a regime of lack of data. So because we lack of data, uh, you, you might, it, it, it might be more efficient to to reduce the information you use in order to make a, 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 to, to make better in, in learning, uh, your learning is more efficient. But if you have enough data, you, you should use all the data you, you have. Okay, so the, the conclu conclusion about th this part is that uh, uh, the prediction of heat waves is an example of a probabilistic classification problem. So we use off-the-shelf CNN uh, algorithm. So we adapt them a bit to the specific situation. So for instance, we use probability score, we use undersampling, we use transfer learning. And so the, the, the key point is that the two weak heat waves can be efficiently predicted up to 30 days ahead, seamlessly dealing with uh, fast dynamical and slow physical drivers. And so we have more, more conclusion that uh, I have not presented you. And so machine learning is, is a also very useful for process studies, because then you can, uh, here I, I have shown you some optimal result, but then you can take out soil moisture, you can add this, you can uh, do this, trick that, and then doing this, you have uh, very simple tools to understand w which are the physical process that actually drive uh, the, the heat waves. And so the key idea is that we are really clearly in a regime of lack of data for getting an, uh, an optimal prediction. Okay, so I have shown you that we can produce more <coughs> extreme events. We can uh, uh, sample much better the extreme events. Here we are in a regime of lack of data, and so the point would be just to, to try to, to couple mm -hmm. this. And so I will show you what we have done. So we are working on that for climate model. We don't have a re result yet for climate model, but I will show you what we have done in, uh, in simplified models and uh, how we, we try to, to go fo forward. Okay, so first uh, uh, methodological point. In order to have efficient relevant algorithm, a key point is uh, how you will select the trajectory with this algorithm. This is the key of the algorithm. And so this, this will be key. The, the key will be the score function that are used at this uh, selection stage. I just give you one example here with uh, the simplest mm -hmm. algorithm which is the Adaptive Multilevel Splitting Algorithm, AMS. So it's uh, an algorithm that uh, uh, was proposed by Serou and Guyader, and uh, that has been studied a lot uh, by uh, Tony Lelièvre and people working uh, on his group. So we use it a lot because it's very simple mm -hmm. and very efficient. So it's well adapted to, to, to study transition from one attractor to another, for, for instance. And so here the... the so this is a sketch of a phase space. So you have a, a part of a phase space A, a part of a phase space B. And so you, you can think of A as being attracting. So it's a local attractor. And so if you start from X, uh, most of the trajectory will, uh, will go back to A. But there is some uh, uh, small probability that you might actually uh, go 
to, the, to another set, which is B. So, so for instance, uh, uh, you might have multi-stability and you, you need to go through a barrier to go to, towards B. And so the point here is to compute, uh, starting from X, this small probability to go to B. So the algorithm works this way. So you make an ensemble simulation. So you make N trajectory. So for the sake of a sketch here, S in N is equal to 3, 1 to 3 blue trajectory. But typically N is more like uh, 1,000 or 10,000, depending uh, on the application. Then you, you will measure how good you were in going in the direction of B with a function Q. Q is a score function. It will be used for selection. And so for instance, here you see that uh, uh, those are the level lines of Q. And so you see that uh, the trajectory 3 was the best. Uh, the trajectory 1 was the worst. And so what you will do, you will kill the trajectory 1. You will forget about it. And you will replace it by a new trajectory. But you will use one of the initial conditions uh, of the others taken randomly and uh, on the same level line from the point of view of the function Q. New trajectory, and so you get the purple trajectory. So by construction, the purple trajectory is better than the, the one trajectory. So the new sets of trajectory is better than the, the previous set of trajectory. So you go forward. And so you will do that iteratively until uh, all your trajectory cross the barrier and go to, to B. And so each time, I mean, when you do the math, uh, if you do that correctly, then each time you have selected n minus 1 trajectory among n, and so, you can, and so the probability of, of your new set is n minus 1 divided by n. So if you have to do k iteration, so you get an estimate p 1 minus 1 over n to the k uh, for the, the probability of your last set. And so you, 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 you got uh, uh, plenty of uh, trajectory going through, and you have a very nice estimation of uh, the, the probability. So when the algorithm works, it's, 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 it's really uh, amazing. So for instance, for the Van der Waals Canilliard uh, dynamics, uh, we were able to estimate probability of order 10 to the minus 20. Uh, and uh, we were able to compare this probability to, to mathematical formula. It was working very well. Of course, there is a, the point is that you are selecting trajectory going in some direction through this function Q. And so everything is in this function Q. If you have a good Q, you push your systems in a good direction. It works wonderfully well. If you have a bad Q, then it can be worse than, uh, than anything else. And so the point is, uh, which is the good score mm -hmm. function? So either you are a good physicist and you understand very well your systems and you devise your Q yourself, or you might like to learn it. And so there is, a, in, the, in the mathematics of the algorithm, I mean, it is known that the optimal score function is called the committer function. So the, the committer function is, <coughs> it is a function that depends on the phase space, on x. So it is the probability that starting from x, you go uh, first to b rather than going first to a. So it's actually what you want to compute. And so this is, a, this is the problem, is that what you want to compute is what you should use as an, an optimal score function. And so this is where the chicken and the egg problem uh, arrive. So you want to, 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 build, to learn a good score function, but you need this score function to run your algorithm. And so this is uh, what we, we, the point here. If you have already data, you can use machine learning to run an approximation of this optimal score function to use it to run the relevant algorithm, and then you produce more data, and you might uh, uh, be able to, to get an iterative algorithm this way to, to do that. And so this, uh, well, in statistical uh, physics, there are many uh, examples of cases where you, you need to use this uh, adaptive strategy uh, uh, when you have uh, something like a chicken and a very problem like, uh, like this one. And so in a, in a paper with uh, Rob Jacques, Vivian Lecomte, and uh, Takeiro Nemoto, we did that for the, uh, for instance, in the case of uh, jardina kurshan algorithm. We, we implemented such a, uh, uh, 
adaptation strategy in order to improve the skill of, uh, of algorithm. So this was just uh, uh, toy models in, in, in one dimension. And so what we, uh, so here I will show you the other result. Uh, so this is another toy model. So this is just a diffusion, uh, Langevin models. So you have dx over dt is minus the gradient of v. And so this is just a, a plot of the potential here in dimension two. So you have two attractors, uh, two global attractors, and you have one uh, metastable state here. And so the point is to compute the probability to go from A to B. So you can go either directly or go through here. And so this is the plot of uh, the committer function, the probability to go to B before to go to, to A. And so we, we, have two, we have several ways to compute uh, this approximation of the score function. So on the previous part, I have shown you an ex a, a, a way for which we were using uh, directly machine learning uh, and making a classification. This is uh, the, the, the probabilistic classification I, I discussed previously. But we also have used another approach, which is uh, to first learn a Markov chain from the data to approximate the effective dynamics. And so there are many ways to learn such a Markov chain. So we have used a way which is called the analog Markov chain, which is the simple, simplest possible way to do that. And so it's, um, we will we'll approximate a Markov chain from the set of observed states uh, in our data set. And so basically, the analog method was first used by uh, uh, Ed Lawrence uh, very long ago in the weather uh, community. So basically, the idea is very simple. You want to predict the weather. So you look at in your data set, you look at the field that, I, that are the closest to the one you have today, and you look at what happened in the past uh, w w with the field that were close to the one you, you, you have today. So this is why it is called uh, uh, analog. And so here you, so for instance, you, uh, you want, so those are the states you observed in the past, uh, well, a few of them. Those were their image by the dynamics. So we, there is a time step here in between. So for instance, in our case, the time step will be a few days. And so you, so you know that, uh, uh, you know that this one, uh, led to this other field. And so what you do in order, to, so you take the, the field Xn, and so you, you look at all these neighbors. So you look at, you look at k nearest neighbors of Xn, and then you will say that uh, the probability to go from Xn to some other state here will be along the red arrows. So uh, with probability one over k. Okay, so the black lines are what were observed in the data set, and the red arrow are what you will, you, what you will use uh, in your, in your uh, uh, Markov chain approximation of the dynamics. So it's, there is somehow a coarse graining, a coarse graining which is made at a scale which is given by, uh, 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 which is related to k. But here you, the point is that you have no mesh. I mean, you just look at the nearest neighbors uh, of uh, of uh, your, your state uh, with uh, some uh, uh, some uh, no norm or, or distance. Okay, so the, the, the good point about that is that you don't need any mesh. You can do that in any dimension. Of course, you should think about uh, think. But if you are in very large dimension, everything mm -hmm. will depend on the norm you will choose. And so if there is no, and so you, you should be careful in thinking of uh, which norm you, you, you might use. But w once, you, once you, you have this approximation, you really have a Markov chain approximation of your dynamics, and you can begin to compute uh, you ca uh, uh, statistics on this Markov chain. For instance, you can compute the, the, mar the, the committer, the approximate committer. And so for instance, this is the formula for our Markov chain. And this is uh, an equation that uh, is solved by the committer function. And then this is a linear equation. And we can just solve it to get an approximate uh, committer function from, from your data only. 
So if we, then what we have done is to use this uh, approximate commuter function uh, rather than uh, 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 our uh, uh, commuter function based on the uh, uh, physical uh, thinking. And so you see here, for instance, uh, in green, you have uh, the convergence of the AMS algorithm with the numbers of uh, particles we use, the numbers of clones we use with the uh, uh, AMS algorithm. So the green one is uh, when we use the database commuter function. So you see that it converges very fast to the black line here, which is the, the, the truth. And you see here, those are two commuter functions that we were using uh, that were not stupid, but uh, they give uh, still uh, results which are much worse than the learned commuter function as soon as uh, your, your, your data set, your, your, your number of clones is, is larger. And so this is another, here we, we look at how it converges as not as a function of the numbers of uh, particles in the algorithm, but as the, uh, when we, we vary the data set length. And here too, you see that, uh, you know, we, with only uh, five, so for instance, with only a few examples of transition from one attractor to another, we really get a convergence, which is uh, uh, quite good for this, uh, toy problem. And so we did that too uh, for uh, more involved problems. So this is a chaotic dynamics in six dimension, uh, toy model for the, the atmosphere dynamics. And so here too, we see that uh, learning the committer from the data works much better than trying to, to, to have a committer uh, uh, that you, 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 you might uh, decide uh, yourself. And so the conclusion about this part is that we can learn the committer function from dynamical data set, either using the definition or first learning an approximate Markov dynamics. So this analog Markov chain does not require an impossible discretization of the phase space, and it, it can use any kinds of dynamical data, including short uh, trajectory. And so the using the, the learned commuter function is much more efficient than using user-defined score function with the AMS relevant algorithm for, for these two toy models. And so the range of applicability of this approach in terms of uh, system dimension and complexity is still to be studied. And so we, we have not done it yet for climate models, but this is a, a kind of research that we, we, we are doing uh, now. So I will uh, stop here. Th thank you for your, your, your attention.